All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us today uh, for our first webinar for uh, Lubruary. I think this is our fourth year or so that we're doing this. Um, but uh, yeah, we've got a great lineup set up for us um, with, with webinars each week, talking about all things lubrication um, and kicking things off today. Um, seems like a pretty good place to start. We're gonna be having Terry Harris with Reliable Process Solutions talking about um, designing effective lubrication storage. Um, so something not everybody necessarily thinks about or puts much time and, and effort into, but it's certainly um, a key part of a, of a good lubrication program. So he's got lots of great information to share and uh, we're looking forward to uh, having Terry with us today. Um, before I turn things over to him, just a couple housekeeping bits. Um, we are recording this, so if you have to hop off early, um, we'll have it up on our website later later this afternoon. So um, if you need the link to it, you can just shoot me an email or you can go onto our website and um, look in the, the webinar archive section and uh, you'll be able to find that there. So that's, that's good to keep note of. And um, also we welcome questions. Um, so you can be typing those in throughout the presentation and I'll toss those over to Terry, um, you know, throughout the presentation, if it makes sense. And then obviously at the end, we'll, we'll set aside some time for some additional Q and A at that point. Um, so definitely don't, don't feel shy, um, toss those over to us. And um, just always like to remind, you know, we are doing this live. So if we have any audio issues or if, you know, the internet gets a little wonky on us, just, uh, just bear with us. We'll try and get things resolved as quickly as we can, but um, sometimes those things happen. Um, so I think without further ado, I will turn the screen over to Terry and let him get started. All right. Thanks, Maureen. I'll get my presentation up here and we'll be ready to go. All right. Welcome, everybody. And, and, and again, like, like uh, Maureen was saying, uh, part of your lubrication program is, is getting things right in the very beginning so that we can get uh, clean lubes to our equipment, uh, make sure the lubes in, that are in our equipment stay clean. So we're going to look at some slides today on, on how to effectively design the room and what kind of things you should look at as, as you're doing that. A little bit about myself for the people on here that, that don't know anything about me. Uh, I own a company called Reliable Process Solutions. I uh, do a lot of training and consulting, and we also build uh, lube rooms and, and, and lube, lube equipment. So again, you can see some of the things we do. Uh, we do some RCM facilitation with our own RCM database. Uh, we do some predictive and proactive training, lots of lubrication training, and helping people set up lube programs and uh, lube routes, writing lube PMs and things like that. And you can see down through the list here uh, a lot of other items that, that, that we do as a company. So again, I always talk, start off with this curve and you can see over on the left-hand side up at the very top of our proactive area of the PF curve, we have lubrication excellence up there. You know, the company I worked for for 25 years, we did a lot of these uh, different programs you see on the left-hand side, you know, with precision alignment and precision balance, finding select suppliers that make the best equipment. But what we realized uh, as we went along here is one of the things you have to take care of, you can, you can buy a precision balance piece of equipment, you can do precision installation, you can do precision alignment. But the first time your maintenance technician comes by and dumps a dirty lube in there, you know, all your efforts are gonna go to, go to waste here because those dirty lubricants or lubricants with moisture in there are still gonna cause your equipment to fail. So if you're doing your maintenance over here on this right-hand side of the curve where human senses are telling you that something's going wrong, you're only going to be 10 to 20 percent effective or efficient maintenance. As we start using our predictive technologies, our mechanical ultrasound, vibration analysis, oil analysis, as we start doing some of these technologies, we can become 30 to 50 percent effective or efficient maintenance because we're finding failures way up the curves where corrections can be made. But we're going to talk about lubrication exits over here on the proactive side. The things we do while our equipment is new, while it's in that perfect operating condition, what are all the things we can do to keep it in that condition and become 70 to 100% proactive in maintenance? And what, again, one of the most important ones which we're gonna to cover today is lubrication excellence. So some questions here, why would we consider lubrication storage? You know, a lot of my customers understand it. They go, they go to their management teams or their people that run the plant control the money and they say they wanna build a lube room or buy a lube room. And sometimes managers don't understand, well, why would I spend that kind of money to store my lubes effectively? 
Well, some of the things we need to consider when we're talking about lube storage is a lot of your new lubes aren't clean. So if you do uh, oil analysis on your new lubricants, many times you find out that the lubricants have high particle counts. Sometimes they have moisture. And, you know, due to the way they make steel drums, the lubricants aren't clean in the new drum. So sometimes we have to filter and clean our new lubricants before we store them. You know, lubricants delivered to facilities. I have a few pictures on here that show lubricants that are delivered and, and, and it, they're left, the drums are left outside. Lubricants uh, are not taken care of after delivery. You know, lubricants equipment, the equipment that you use to apply the lubricants to your plant, sometimes those are, they need to be stored in clean areas. And we got a few pictures and illustrations, you know, of those. We need to keep our lubricants from being exposed to moisture materials that are around our facilities. That's one of the things we talk about. What kind of foreign material do you have at your facilities that we need to keep the lubes away from? Lubricants, I've seen at many facilities, the lubricants are stored in non-spill control areas. So this is something that a good lubricant storage area can do is take care of any spills or leaks from your lubricant containers. And then again, getting our lubes away from other flammable uh, products. You know, a lot of times I go to plants and I, and I see flammable products stored like, you know, they're stored in areas where there's gasoline, where there may be diesel fuel, other things stored around our lubricants. That's, that creates some other issues in, in the area of safety that we'll talk about later. <clears throat> but it says here in your design considerations, no matter what manufacturer lubricants you're looking at or using, there's still good reasons to filter and store your lubricants in a controlled environment. You know, if you, if you think about the Louisiana, Texas area with the humidity they have down there about six months out of the year, those are bad conditions to be storing any lubricants in. So they need to be inside in a, maybe a dehumidified area. You know, it says if the lube is in a drum and it has been filled to low levels at the blender, what about the risk of contaminants when you get it to the plant? Now, I have a couple customers, they've decided not to build lube rooms and they require their lube vendors to filter the lubricants down to these real low levels before they're delivered. And a couple of these plants that I deal, do business with have their own on-site lab, so they actually check the drums as they come to the plant. If it's out of specification for cleanliness, they send the drum back. But again, once the lube's at the plant, how do you store it, how do you keep it clean uh, in, in the environments that some of you have at your facilities? Design consideration. It's a great, not a good idea, but a great idea to be familiar with your plant operation. What contaminants are present in your plant or present in the loop storage area? And there's, these come in, in quite a bit of different forms here. So we've got what forms of foreign material are present at your facilities? You know, I've been in fertilizer plants and steel mills and, and recycling plants. You know, even in food plants, even though food plants are clean, you know, a lot of food plants I go into have cardboard dust. And cardboard, of course, is made out of paper. Paper has a lot of silica, a lot of abrasive uh, chemicals in the paper. So even at a food plant where things are relatively clean, we can have foreign material. And then the one thing a food plant has is moisture issues. And anyone that's been in the food business, we know with uh, sometimes there's, there's moisture from steam that's generated. Sometimes there's moisture with wash down practices that we have at our facilities where moisture gets you know, around to all the plants because we keep them very clean. So to do that, sometimes it takes moisture. What about temperature extremes at your facilities? You know, what's the average temperature? Now, if I was building a lube room in the San Diego area, I may recommend that they don't have an air conditioner and they don't have a heater because the, the temperature extremes in San Diego, you know, the, most of the times I've been out there, I've seen highs in the uh, mid to upper 70s. And usually in the mornings, it's uh, high 50s, low 60s. So not temperature extremes that would cause our lubricants to go through any of those extremes and pull moisture in. But, you know, I've also been in areas like where I'm from, where it may be nearly 100 degrees and high humidity in the summer. It may be like uh, the, the winter we've had this year, where it might be zero or 10 below or 20 below. Some of my customers in Canada, you know, they have extremes of mid 80s in the summer and they have extremes of minus 20 in the winter. So those are temperature extremes you have to watch with your lubricants, especially in storage, because the drum can heat up and then when it cools down, it can create enough vacuum to pull moisture in. And it's sometimes if, they're, if the drums are dirty, you know, pull particles in. So these are some considerations to have, you know, where are your lubes are gonna be stored? So when I do lubrication training, I always talk about these five major lubricant failure mode areas. 
you have these temperature extremes we talked about, not only in storage, but in your facilities. We have moisture failure modes. Maybe it's from ambient humidity moisture. Maybe it's from moisture from your process. Four material particles. You know, lots of the companies I do business with, there's lots of four material particles. Uh, in, in, you know, examples, if you've ever been in a steel mill or an aluminum foundry or a, or a fertilizer plant or, or a grain elevator where they have dust particles, lots of four material, lots of four material in the air, and these particles get in your lubricants. You know, we talk viscosity failures, you know, from temperature as oils oxidize, the viscosity changes. Uh, viscosity changes with temperature. One of the things I spend a lot of time on with my lube training is one of the effects of viscosity as your equipment uh, heats up an operation. And then what kind of contamination do you have from other things like maybe chemicals, glycol from cooling systems? There's all other kinds of contamination. So we have to understand what these failure mode areas are and how do we control them at each of your individual facilities. So some program failures that I find at plants. <clears throat> Here's a whole list. I've highlighted a few here, but you know, I've been at plants where there's no procedures for ordering the lubricants. There's no written procedures for receiving them. What happens to that drum or that bucket or that grease when it comes in? I've got a couple pictures here where I find brand new drums of oil that are sitting out in the rain after being delivered. And then how are those lubricants stored you know, after they're delivered? What about improper or no offline filtration? You know, not having a filtration program for your new lubes coming in or your lubes that are in your equipment could be a program failure. This is one that's not very well understood. There's a lot of information on there. I do a lot of training on this, is, but the, all your lubricants have additive packages. And these additives can separate and settle to the bottom of the drum. And it's the same thing in your storage system. I'm gonna show you some pictures of some lube rooms later on where one of the pra best practices is, and we did it at the company I came from, was you recirculate that lube storage tank every month not only to refilter it, but we remix that additive package for those additives that settle to the bottom. Some more program failures, no best practice lubrication storage rooms. You know, what is a best practice room? Well, sometimes we have to answer some of the questions we'll answer in this presentation here to find out what do we need. What about consolidation programs? I've been at three companies over the last couple of years here when I went in to talk about lube storage. You know, one company had 26 different lubes they were using. One company was up close to 40. So we looked at consolidating these lubes down to, and you know, and a lot of times the lube's the same lube, just a, maybe a different additive package or it's a different company, it's the same additive package. But we were able to consolidate those companies down to 10 or 15 lubricants, which makes it feasible to design a lube storage room. You know, not being trained on filtration. I've got a few slides at the end of today that trains people on how, how to filter lubes, what to look for, what to ask for on your, in your filters. No program to reduce moisture. You know, a couple of my customers were there, one of them was makes roofing shingles, and part of making a roofing shingle was washing or you know, spraying water on the shingle material to cool it down. Well, this water gets on bearings, it gets in gearboxes. So we worked on a lot of programs to keep the water out, which improves the life of the equipment by reducing the moisture and getting lubricants stored away from those moisture areas. What about this one, contamination, contaminated new oil? We'll talk about this over and over, but you'll find out that new oils aren't clean. Improper or maybe no filtration of your new lubes. We're assuming they're new, we're assuming they're good. Many times they're not. Improper filtration of process equipment lubes. You know, the lubricants you have running in your gearboxes and in your equipment, you know, as those, uh, as that equipment runs, you pick up particles, not only from the air, from the process, but sometimes you pick up particles from the equipment as it wears. We need to keep these particles out because they create more wear. You know, I've got, I've got a customer right now close to where I live here, and we're, we're doing a lot of filtration of their new lubes. And now we're putting in systems where every month or every three months, they can go out there and filter their, their critical gearboxes, removing those particles. You know, not having any filtration practices or filtration equipment on, on the facility. Those are, those are failure modes. What about vent breathers? You know, like the desk case breather or, you know, air sentry makes a breather. But we put these breathers on our critical equipment to keep moisture out. And these, these breathers also keep particles out. So it's a good practice to check into these breathers uh, and get them on your critical equipment. And then the two we're going to talk about is poor loop storage methods. 
and poor lube equipment storage. So not only do we want to store our lubes in a clean area, but our lubrication equipment, our containers we use to carry around the, the oil, our grease guns. And, and I think I saw you, we posted a picture of a grease gun yesterday, off, which I copied, copied off of their site, but we'll, we'll look at that one again. Moisture failure modes, ambient conditions, humidity, rain. Like I said, the Louisiana, Texas area where all the refineries, chemical plants are, very humid conditions, lots of rainy, rainy periods where we can pick up a lot of moisture failures. And again, lubrication storage methods and the way we store our equipment, all failure modes in the area of lubrication. You can see a lot more uh, down through, through this we won't cover today, but if this is covered in another training program. So again, many of the failures of our lubricants in a plant starts when the lube products are received and stored at the plant. We pick up moisture, we pick up foreign material, you know, we pick up things around our lube containers and our lube equipments. And the comment that I'll keep making, and you can verify this, or we can, I'll, I can send you methods to check your drums, but new lubes are not clean. They may be clean to some standard, but they're not clean to a standard to make your equipment last a long time. I don't know if any of you have seen, I put this note in here to remind me, but I was watching the show, How It's Made, and they were showing companies how they make a steel drum. Well, when they make a steel drum, it's basically a big, big roll of steel that comes off and they roll the drum and put the two little grooves in it. And then they weld it together. And then they put the ends on and weld the ends on. And then a lot of times that drum, they put the, the, the fittings in the bungs and that goes to a lube manufacturer to fill up. And I've been at some drum filling facilities uh, and, and seen this happen. Well, those drums are not clean. And the lubricants they put in there sometimes may be clean, but if the drum's not clean, you have all those particles of making that steel drum. If you take royal purple, for instance, the reason that all royal purple oil comes in a plastic drum is because they've tried to eliminate that failure mode of using steel drums. You know, some of your other companies like Lubriplate, they actually coat the inside of the drum sometimes before they put the oil in. So you're always protected from that iron and those particles in there. So, but again, that's a failure mode is these steel drums. This is one of my customers. This is where their lubes were stored. You know, out in the plant next to this big tank, you can see open containers here. We can see funnels, all kinds of bad practices in the storage methods that, that they're doing here. This is another customer. This is diatomaceous earth and filter aid. And look where the lubricants are stored, right around all the, all the highly abrasive particles. And you can see filter dust all over the containers. We can see a container down there that's half full of oil. That's probably getting particles in there. And I can tell you from these practices, they weren't getting very long life out of their gearboxes and the hydraulic systems. Well, now they've got a, a, a lot cleaner area. The lubes are stored in a clean uh, maintenance shop area. So again, they're trying to improve these practices, but this was a major failure mode at this facility. So why do we need good uh, lubrication storage? Well, like we said, lube products are protected from the environment. That's one of the things we wanna do is get them away from plant dirt, your foreign material that you have at your plant, we want to keep them away from moisture. You know, you want to keep them out of sunlight. People say, well, what does sunlight do? Well, if, you, if you've got a drum of oil setting in the sunlight and the sunlight heats that drum up during the day, and then at night that when that drum cools off, even if the drum's never been open, you create a little bit of vacuum in there and you'll actually pull some moisture into those drums over time. You know, you need some good lube storage. You can filter the plant lubes. You know, new lubes or lubes as you use them need to be filtered. You know, storage of your lube equipment, your containers. If you're using funnels, I try to keep get people away from using funnels because funnels are always covered with foreign material particles. Your grease guns need to be clean and stored in a clean area. If you have filters, they need to be stored in a clean area. We need to keep our lubes separate from other plant chemicals and products so they don't get mixed up. I've been in a, I was in a storage room not very long ago where they had lab chemicals and alcohol and all kinds of things stored in there that could be contaminated with the jugs that were in there. You know, with other products. You know, designated areas with your products properly labeled. I mean, when, the, when a guy walks up to your container, you're going to assume he knows it's ISO 150, or is it, is it going to be labeled and, and imp, increase the probability that it's ISO 150 that he's getting out? <clears throat> so this is Hydrotex Grease right here. And, and Hydrotex is a company in Texas. They, they have a grease manufacturing and a, and a loading or a barrel drum filling facility in, in Oklahoma. But some of the most expensive greases and oils on the market, they're expensive because they're some of the cleanest greases on the market. 
Uh, I've been in their plant and they're one of the companies that probably clean their oil before they make the grease better than anybody else in the industry. So a high quality grease, high quality additive packages in their grease and oil. Here's a company using their grease. But look at the condition that the drums are in. Look at the condition that the, the grease gun is in. And at this plant, the operator greases these hot bearings twice per shift with that grease gun. But again, major failure modes here, particles. This is a plant that makes roofing shingles. So there's, this is silica dust, very abrasive dust for, to, to get into bearings and gearboxes. So again, we have, to, we have to change these kind of practices. You know, this is a picture I saw on LinkedIn last night that UE posted. But look, at, look at this grease gun, the condition it's in. And somebody's gonna take this grease gun and apply this grease to a, to a could be a highly critical bearing in your plant. The end's hanging down here. There's part four material particles all over it. I remember my guys, when we got into this, they would bring the grease guns in every night and they'd put them in a big Ziploc bag and they stuck them in a cabinet. The grease guns were always clean and the end of the grease gun was always covered and clean. So again, these are practices that we have to move away from in our, in our processes to get rid of this four material uh, failure mode. Again, getting our products stored in a controlled temperature. You know, one of the things we do with our lube rooms we build, we air condition them and heat them. People say, well, why would you do that? Well, we don't want our lubricants going through temperature changes where moisture could be pulled in. You know, grease is a lot of times, you know, they, it, people store grease cartridges on the end standing up. And the reason they do that is because they say if they lay them down, the grease separates and oil leaks out. Well, it will, and that's more likely because you're storing them in an outside plant environment where it gets hot. If you put them in a room where it stays 70 or 72 degrees, the grease will not separate like that. It's better to actually store the grease cartridge on its side so the grease oil is evenly distributed through the grease. Again, temperature causes things to oxidize. You know, we got to keep our products stored in controlled humidity. A lot of the lube rooms that we build have uh, dehumidifiers in them. Our products are labeled invisible. It's a clean room to fill your lube equipment. You know, a lot of our, our customers are using the oil safe and using the new ISO link containers from Descase. Some of those don't even have to be opened anymore. We, we fill them right off the pump, you know, with an ISO uh, dry lock fitting. Here's one that, like we talked about before, recirculating the lubes that you have stored to mix up the additive package. Because the additives that many, many of the additives will settle out over time. Well, by remixing that, and I'll show you some pictures of some piping systems where we remix, but Every once in a while, we want to remix those, those uh, containers to remix those additives. It's better inventory control. You know, we, we like to use plastic tanks. You can walk in there right away and see that you may need to order a drum of oil. And again, it's part of this going back to greases is using the oldest lubes first. So if we don't have these huge inventories, you know, one of my customers, when Justin and I were doing the lube audit, they had drums stored in four or five different areas, had over 200 drums of oil stored at the facility because procurement said they got a cheaper price when they bought 20 drums instead of buying one. Well, those drums do oxidize depending on how you store over time. That oil will oxidize, your additive packages will go away, you'll pick up moisture. Those, so they weren't really saving any money by buying 20 drums at a time. Another storage area here, and, and again, lots of, lots of storage areas I see with abrasive products stored around them. This is four drums I pulled up to a plant. I'd actually, we'd actually build a lube room at this facility. When I pulled up to, to do some other lube training, it was raining that day. There's four brand new drums of mobile oil sitting in the rain. And you can see one of them's got oil up around the bung. So, you know, if, if these drums would have been hot in the sun that day and it rained on them and cooled them down and you get water over that, over that bunk hole that's not been opened, we can actually pull moisture into the drum. So again, these are, these are receiving methods that need to be changed, storage methods that need to be changed. And again, some of these are plant cultures. We've been doing it this way for 20 years. How do we change the culture and move to lubrication excellence? So again, if you see things like this at your plant, and, and so this is what I always tell myself, these are failure modes and we have to correct. So we can take steps to eliminate receiving and storage failures by designating clean areas and developing written procedures. And this is one of the things I try to help customers do. What are your, what's, where's your written procedures at? How are we going to receive? How are we going to store? How are we going to handle all of our lube products and our lube equipment? And then getting that training done to make sure this happens. So it's a must for any plant that's moving to lubrication excellence. Remember this comment. I make it all the time. New lubes are dirty. 
lubes must be clean and dry. New lubes should be filtered. And the actual truth to that is new lubes must be filtered if you want long equipment life. Your lube environment must be controlled and your lube equipment must be stored clean. So again, some key points here in lubrication storage that we need to consider. If you look at this chart, and this is one of the things that, that people don't understand when they start talking about particles. You can see on down here about 25% uh, up the page, it says the naked eye visibility limit. So these numbers on here are microns. So the lube film thickness on a loaded bearing or a loaded gear is five microns, the thickness of a red blood cell, which you'll see down at the bottom. But the naked eye visibility limit is 40 microns. So if you would get up and out of your chair right now and go through your office or your room and you run your fingers across the top of a door seal, a picture frame, or maybe even the floor, the particles that you see on your fingers, those are 40 and 50 micron particles. We can actually see them with the human eye. So in a, in a bearing or a gear that has a five micron film thickness, those are like boulders going through your equipment. But it's that fine dust that's actually causing the wear of your equipment, causing your bearings to fail and wear out early, causing your gears to fail and wear out early, causing your hydraulic systems to wear and fail early. So we're trying to control stuff down below 40 microns. And you can see the human hair is only 70 microns in diameter. So we're working trying to control very small particles. This is a slide that comes from Caterpillar's training. They say this is a human hair. So Caterpillar, as we know, has got a reputation in the industry as some of the most reliable mining equipment and equipment in the industry. And the reason they've been doing that since the mid 80s is they have very good filters on their equipment. They filter out all these big 40 micron particles. So this human hair is 70 to 80 microns in diameter. That big dark spot in the middle, they don't want any of those particles in their oil. Uh, the, the very small particle, the one micron particle, they're not worried too much about those because they're smaller than the film thickness, but they want to get those big particles out. And by doing that, Caterpillar equipment is more reliable and, and lasts longer in the industry. So what I had to do with my maintenance crew, I used to run a maintenance crew. I had 10 maintenance guys and we, I was doing this training on lubrication excellence, but people have to see something to believe it. So the slide on the right was a sample pulled out of a, a cold bucket elevator gearbox. The oil in the sample bottle looked clear. It was gold in color. But when I sent it in, this was the ISO code that came back, a 221917. And then we took a picture at a 100, 100 power microscope. And this is what the particles were in there at that 221917. I found a lot of brand new oils that have that ISO code. Most of them are around in the, in the 1819 range, but I found new oils in this condition. Now we filtered that oil with a 10 micron beta 1000 filter, which comes out to be the picture on the left hand or the right hand side, which is a 17, 14, 11. And you see very few particles there. And I just asked my guys, this is the actual slide I used, how much longer will the gearbox last if we can keep it in the condition on the right instead of the condition it was in on the left? And again, it sometimes could be three, four, five times longer that that gearbox will last because there's no particles in there to chew up our bearings and gears. So again, a nice visual illustration of what we're talking about. But again, bearings, you can see here, this is what a bearing looks like under a microscope. These surfaces are, are not exactly polished like we see with the naked eye, but they're rough like this, but we have to maintain that lube film thickness, which is the yellow. But if we get a particle, a 40 micron particle in there in this little area, that's five to 10 microns thickness. So you can see here, it's 1 20th the thickness of a human hair. You're talking about five to 10 microns. Well, if, if we get a dust particle in there, that bearing is going to grind that dust particle up. And it's going to do that over the cycle of, you know, 1800 RPMs and millions of revolutions a day. You can see why bearings actually wear out with these particles. So again, develop some written procedures to get your products filtered and stored. Develop filtration standards for moisture and FM. Find out what those contaminants are out of your plant and correct them. You know, design areas away from your foreign material moistures and contaminants ambient control. You know, a lot of times I tell people, let's not put the storage room, the storage room right here because all this foreign material is present. Let's put it somewhere else. Uh, store your lube, act, lube equipment away from, in these areas away from particles. Now, this is a lube storage room that was built by a, a customer I work with. They had a big warehouse. They built this insulated uh, metal coated room in the middle of the warehouse. This was all for lube storage. Inside, they, you can see they've got their oil-safe containers. They've got their, their 
tanks with uh, breathers on them. Everything is stored in this nice clean room and stored in a nice condition. So again, they've taken the steps to get their lubricants into an air conditioned heated room. And this happens to be in the middle of Iowa where it gets pretty cold in the winter, it gets hot and humid in the summer. The only thing this company had to add eventually was recycle for the tanks. They didn't put that in on the, on the first uh, go around here, but it's on there now. So you can see nice storage system, nice room. Here's a customer here. This is one of the units built in a shipping container, but you can see they've got nice clean plastic tanks. They've got a cabinet that they're going to store their oil safe containers and all their equipment in. Everything's in a clean, controlled environment. This is a lube room we shipped to a customer just a few months ago. And you can see it's got a nice steel floor. It's got spill control in it. There's an office in the back. They've got the uh, pumps here to transfer their lubricants into the containers. But again, a nice, clean lube storage room. Here's another one. If you look underneath the filters, these are recycle lines. So this company can not only they can take these pumps and fill the containers in the background with the breathers on them, but they can also, once a month, they'll turn these tanks on and recirc them for 20 to 30 minutes to remix their additive package and keep the lubricants in top condition. So again, there's lot, lots of options here and things you can do with your lube storage room. These happen to be air piston pumps, and the other one I think you saw was electric pumps. So here's, here's a room here. This has got total spill control. These yellows are just step overs, but you know the, the spill control here will hold about 550 gallons on a major spill. There's a spill container underneath the steel, color-coded steel tanks. And you can see on the upper left-hand corner of this, they've got hose reels. So actually in this room, nobody's allowed in this room but the oil uh, technician, the loop tech, and all the people get their lubricants from the hose reels on the outside box here. So they can get whatever lubricant to fill their mine trucks and get fill up their containers. But this room stays in this pristine condition all the time. So again, uh, this, this is more and more people going to this, especially in the mining industry, to keep people out of the lube room. I've seen lube rooms that we've sold, and one year later, they look like, uh, you know, a tornado went through. So the, this in here is going to be a nice, clean room forever. This is a little 20-foot unit with steel tanks, steel piping, steel floors. So you can see this is a customer spec room. Here's what a 40-foot container looks like with, with the doors and the roll-up doors. So again, lots of options we can look at for storage, uh, lube storage. This is actually a Cargill uh, room. It's uh, 1,600 feet underground and about three and a half to four miles under Lake Erie. All the lubes are stored in, in these containers un under the lake there. And these pumps pressurize hose reels. So again, this is a room here where the mine trucks just pull up outside. They get whatever lube they uh, need in their mine truck and nobody ever goes in the room. It's locked and everything's accessed from the outside. And the hose reels are kept pressurized with the air pump. So a nice setup. Here's a customer here with a nice lube storage cabinet. And this is what I try to do at my plant. We keep the oil safe containers in a cabinet, whether it's in the plant or in the shop. We keep our filter. We have, as you can see here, there's a funnel in a plastic bag. Uh, everything's stored in the cabinet, everything's clean. So again, some good efforts in, in lubrication and lubrication equipment storage. Here's another example of a room with plastic tanks, a drip pan. But again, this, this one here, just, just all kinds of different options for building. They're all usually air conditioned and heated. And again, what kind of layout would you need for your room? This is something we help people do, whether you're using a shipping container or whether you're using a room that you have at your facility, th these are, there's, we can help you out, lay those rooms out and get the right equipment in there for the products that you use. We also sell self-contained units and these self-contained units, these are color-coded tanks. You can set these in a spill pan, put forklift pockets under and move these around the plant. Here's one here that's made with plastic tank. This customer actually drives this around the plant and tops off hydraulic systems. They, they kidney loop hydraulic systems. They fill up equipment. So again, lots of different options here. If you're not gonna build a lube room, then maybe these self-contained units will be what you need. But again, it's all part of getting your lubes filtered into these tanks, keeping them clean, and uh, through the whole process. You know, safety comes into consideration when you're building a lube room. You know, I don't want my, a lot of customers don't want their people handling steel drums anymore, moving them around. So with this here, this trolley system here, they can pick the drums up outside, move them into the lube room. This happens to actually be an explosion proof lube room or at, at a coal mine. So all the equipment in there is explosion proof. But the drums can be picked up outside and moved anywhere they want in the room without anybody getting hurt. So again, that's other other options that are available. 
So what I put in here now is some design consideration. So when you go back and look at how you're going to design your room, step one that I always do, is there a way to consolidate the lubricants to some manageable level? You know, if you've got 26 to 40 lubricants, that's probably too many. We can consolidate these down. If you ever need help with that, just send me your list and I'll, I can help you walk through that. You know, get all your lubricants to one or two locations instead of 10 or 20 drums sitting around a facility in different places. You know, determine any, like I said before, determine those contamination issues you have at your facility. You know, what kind of floor material would it have? What kind of moisture do you have? Another thing I always try to do is determine the size of the containers. You know, how much of that particular lube do you use on a monthly or a weekly or an annual basis? That's going to determine what size container you actually want to put it in. You know, if you're only using five gallons a month, you may want to stay with the five gallon bucket. You know, if you're using three or 400 gallons a month, you may want to put in a bigger container. What, what storage container materials are you looking for? You know, the most common one that we sell is the plastic container, but I've still got customers that like the color coded steel tanks. You know, we build stainless steel tanks, we build aluminum tanks. So depending on what the customer has to decide is what material do I want my lubricant stored in? And then what, what ambient controls do you need? You know, there's places in the country that definitely need air conditioning and not heat. There's places in the country that definitely need heat, and not air conditioning. Some areas need dehumidifiers. You know, what do you need? What kind of safety controls do you need? A lot of times this depends on your on the fire safety guy or, or factory mutual or or whoever your safety guy is at your plant. You know, what kind of safety controls do you need? Do you need a sprinkler system? Do you need a dry chemical system? Do you want smoke alarms? I mean, what, what do you need to know in there? What kind of auxiliary storage do you need? What kind of cabinets and shelves and things like that do you need to store your lube equipment? You know, we're building run one right now where they want a, a, a rack to hang their grease guns on inside the lube room. What type of pumps do you need? Electric, pneumatic. And I put this comment in here, when you're, whenever you use pneumatic pumps, the way pneumatic pumps cycle, you know, you have to change your filters more often because that cycling of the pneumatic pump will actually wear the filter material out just from that cycling and it'll let particles pass through. So sometimes we have to test to know when the filter's bad, but I just have people change the filter on a regular basis if you're using a pneumatic pump. What filter level do you want to go to? We're going to talk about filters here in a minute, but how clean do you want the oil? You know, there's there, I've got customers that started off at 10 microns beta 1000, and they're down to three microns beta 1000 or three microns beta 2000. They're, they're getting all the particles out and getting really long equipment lights from that. You know, one of the things that, you know, a lot of times when people go in to ask their management team for a loop control room, you know, management duck can't see the, the, the benefit of storing your loops and ambient controls. But what if you tell them you had of a room that's got spill control? No lubric, lubricants can ever leave the room. So you've eliminated some environmental issues. Now, what if you tell them all the lubricants are stored in a steel box with some fire system controls in there? So now you can't ever have a fire around your lubricants. These are all things that help you sell the lube room. What's the access to the lube room? You know, how many doors? Where's it going to be located? Do you want uh, key punch pads on the door? How many people do you want to give access to the lube room? I sold one up in Africa or in Alaska, and the guy called and told me the room was so nice that everybody takes their lunch breaks in the lube room. Well, that becomes an issue, right? When you've got when you got too many people in there. You know, what kind of accessories do you want? Hose reels, external valves. There's, you know, we sell meters to to let people know how much each lube they've used. External fill options where a bulk truck comes up and fills the lube room through a set of filters. You know, reemphasize material storage safety is, you know, lubricants do not put off vapors until they get up to five or 600 degrees. So they're very safe to store, but we don't want to store any hazardous chemicals in there. You know, if you've got ex areas where you have explosion proof issues, either from dust or gases, you have to consider where that room's going to be. Do you need explosion proof in those areas? What are your power requirements? You know, a lot of plants have 483 phase or 480 single phase available. So the room may need a transformer. But again, what are the power requirements needed for the room? So again, recycle. And this is something that everybody needs to consider when building a, uh, a lube room is, do I need to recycle that container? How often am I going to use the oil in there? And lots of articles out there if you want to read about this, but at, some additives do settle and they need to be remixed over time. If you're storing your your oils right now on steel drums. Where do you think the additive package is after two months? Well, it's in the bottom of the drum. So 
So how are you mixing your drums up now to, to take advantage of those additive packages that are protecting your equipment? You know, contamination. Sometimes your lubricants can get dirty in storage. Well, now we can recycle and refilter the oil. You know, filters may have bypassed or failed. So we know sometimes we need to test the oil to find that out. But look at all these different additives you'll see in lubricating oils. Anti-foam, which is in your hydraulic oils. Dispersants and engine oils. EP additives that are in your high pr your uh, greases and oils to lay down that extra layer of protection. Lots of detergents in your engine oils. Your AW oils, you'll see a lot of hydraulic oils that are ISO 46 AW. These are anti-wear agents. You know, in the, in the south where you have high humidity, you may want to have extra, there may be extra rust or corrosion inhibitors in there. And then all your mineral-based lubricants have oxidation inhibitors. They keep the oil from oxidizing. But all of these additives you see on this screen right here, they deplete over time based on how you use that oil. So we need to know what our additive package is. And a lot of times, some of these additives you see here settle out. So how do we, how do we know and how do we keep those things in suspension so they actually do or protect our equipment? Another loop storage room here. I think I had that picture in again, but here, here's a chart here. And I, I've got these charts. If anybody wants these, they can get a hold of me or UE, but this is hydraulic system oil. If you look down the left-hand side, these are ISO cleanliness codes for hydraulic oils. And across the top is the clean oil. So the left side is dirty oil. So if we go about midway there, we got a 221917. And like I say, I found a few new oils in that condition, but sometimes you'll find them in your plant in that condition. But if we follow that line across to the line that says 16, 13, 11 at the top, what that means is if we can clean our dirty oil up from that 22, 19, 17 to the 16, 13, 11, you get around five more times life out of your hydraulic system components. Now I've, got, I've done some work in some plastics plants and we did some work at the plant I came from where we're getting eight, nine times the life just going down to that ISO code. So equipment is actually being checked and recorded for life, but these are, these are huge numbers. If you can make your hydraulic systems last five times longer or 10 times longer by going down to a, a, a lower ISO code, you know, what, what does that do for your plant? And you can do the same thing with gearboxes and bearings and things like that. So I have a lot of these charts for those different pieces of equipment. This was put out, these are recommended target uh, ISO codes for different components of a hydraulic system. So you can see some down here on, on the uh, greater than 3000 PSI. There's ISO codes down at 15, 12, 11, and 13, 10, 9. Well, those are, those are getting down to three and five micron beta 1000 filters. So again, these are recommended target levels. So oil filters. I wanted to talk about this before we end it today because a lot of people start saying, well, what's it mean by beta 1000? What's it mean by microns? Well, an oil filters are rated in microns and beta. So the particle size that a filter is rated at is always in a term called microns. The efficiency rating is in a term called beta. So if you look at a nominal filter, this is like the one you use on your automobile. They don't have beta ratings every once in a while. You'll, if you look it up, Mobile One or a Fram Tough Guard filter for your vehicle, it'll have an efficiency rating on there, which you should use the highest efficiency filter on your vehicles to make them last longer. But filters we use in the industry are, have these absolute ratings. They have beta ratings. So the beta rating is found in a lab condition. They measure the number of particles upstream and the number of particles downstream after the filter, and they calculate filter efficiency. So let's say in a lab condition, there's 50,000 particles upstream. When it goes through the filters, there's only 250 particles. So that would be a beta rated filter of 200. So this, if it might be a five micron beta 200 filter, well, five, this beta 200 filter means it's 99.5% efficient. So this is what it looks like in a lab. They're measuring the particles upstream and downstream, and they're giving you that beta rating. So what does that mean? Well, a beta rating of 50, that filter is 98% efficient, but a beta rating of 1000, it's 99.9. So whenever we build a loop room or a loop card or something like that, we put 10 micron beta 1000 filters on. Now you can see that the beta ratings go all the way up in this slide here to 50,000. But if you look at the difference in efficiency between a beta 1000 filter and a beta 10,000 filter, it's only nine hundredths. So a lot of times I'll recommend to people just to buy two beta 1000 filters and put them in series if you want to get the particle counts down. So you can see 
a beta 1000 filter, if you have 100,000 particles upstream, you're only going to have 100 downstream. Well, if you run that through another beta 1000 filter, you're going to take those particles down to one. So we can get particles out. When you're talking to people, you know, I, I talk to people and I hate to use the word Parker, but Parker doesn't have any beta rated filters. A lot of Parker filters are made out of paper and cellulose. Well, you can't get beta 1000 out of paper and cellulose. So it has to be this synthetic media like you get from Donaldson. It's called Syntec. So always ask that question, what is my filter media made out of? If somebody says paper or cellulose or stainless steel screen, you're not gonna get to beta 1000. Now here's, here's, a, here's a system we set up where the tanks in the background are being filled with a, with a truck outside that's pumping about 20 gallons a minute. So you can see here to get the flow, we're going through, we split the filters off in parallel and we also have them in series to get enough flow for the 20 gallons a minute and get our uh, particle counts down. So you can put multiple filters in series, you can put multiple filters in parallel to keep your lubricants or get your lubricants filtered down to these low levels. So again, if you got more questions on filter efficiencies or what, who makes the, who's the companies that makes the actual best filters, you know, don't be afraid to shoot me an email. Now, if you don't want to build a lube room, you know, I've got customers that just buy these lube carts that we build and they'll hook onto the bottom of a gearbox. They'll pull from the bottom and recirc the oil right back into the unit to filter it while it's in service. You can also filter your, from your drums into your containers through these kind of systems. A little trailer on the left is one you can pull around a plant. You can stop at a hydraulic unit and top it off. You can hook it up and kidney loop it and all kinds of things you can do with a little trailer. So there's lots of things on the market that don't necessarily uh, have to, uh, you don't have to build a room right away. You can filter your lubes in the drums, you can recycle them in the drums. So again, lots of things we can do in that area. And then one last slide here, lubricants are safe to store. Like I say though, if you look at the specs on your lubricants, they have flash points between 465 and 525. They're very hard to get them burning. And so if, as long as you control the small fires in your lube room area, they're not dangerous. Like I say, they don't put off, they don't put off vapors that can explode or blow up until they get to real high temperatures. So they're very safe to store. So at this time, Maureen, if we have any questions, uh, we can take some questions and you have my email address there. If you've got other questions or need some help later in the future, just feel free to get a hold of me. All right, great. Thanks, Terry. I think uh, maybe you've got a new, uh business you can do of building break rooms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do that too. <laughs> Separate that out. Yeah, you could probably make some pretty cool ones. Um, anyway, so um, one question that came in, um, so the person said, I understand that storage container has to have a hazard label for chemicals. Does the transfer container or oil sampling bottle require a similar hazard label? No, no, normally not, because like I say, if you go back to this slide, lubricants are not classified as flammable uh, chemicals. They're class 3B fluids. So any fluid that has a flash point above 200 degrees Fahrenheit is a class 3B fluid. Well, you can see here, lubricants are 465 to 525. Very hard to get burning. I do this test sometimes at plants where I'll take a five-gallon steel bucket. I'll put about a gallon of lube in the bottom. I'll take an acetylene torch and put it in there and get it hot enough to burn the lube or get the loop burning, but as soon as you take the torch away, the fire goes out. So if their lubricants are safe to handle and store around a plant, they do not need to be labeled. Okay, cool. Um, someone was wondering um, if there's a best practice for keeping the grease zerk clean on the machines. Oh, keep, well, greases, there's no way to filter greases. So I always tell people, and it's kind of bad news for the oil industry, but greases are not made, most of U.S. manufactured greases are not made by cleaning the oil before you make the grease. So most of your greases in the U.S. or around the world, actually from the major companies are dirty to begin with, but it's very hard to keep greases clean in the equipment. You just want to have good practices when you're putting the grease in. The cleanest greases you can buy are going to be your synthetic types because of the way they're made. So, All right. Um, and how long can an oil sample sit before sending it out for analysis? Yeah, and, and it really should go out. I always tell people to get them out within three days. If they set too long, uh, different things. And, and it, it depends on the sample itself, too. If the sample's clean and dry, maybe nothing will happen to it. But I always recommend, you know, within three days, you get that sample sent out. You know, a lot of your oil labs companies want it there with, you know, send it out within 24 hours. But if you don't want them set up, let them set for a month or two before you send them out. All right. 
Awesome. Okay. Well, let me, I'm going to take the screen back here. I've actually got okay. your info on uh, my last slide here as well. So let's see here. So um, if folks want to take that down, if you've got kind of questions or want to have a more of a conversation with Terry um, about some of the things he discussed today, um, there's a great place to to start right there with his his uh, contact details. So um, thank you, Terry, for for the information today. Really appreciate it. Um, you know, you've got obviously some great options for folks to take a look at, um, and Terry's also got a lot of really cool information on his website as well. So um, if anybody wants wants that, we can we can get that sent to you guys. Um, so you can take a look. Um, and so with that, just a, a note that our next uh, webinar is going to be next Thursday. Um, Adrian Messer, who works with us, is going to be talking about ultrasound assisted lubrication um, and also kind of showing a little bit about how you can utilize our um, Ultra Probe 401 Digital Grease Caddy to assist with that. So he'll talk quite a bit more about just sort of the practice of using ultrasound um, as you're doing your lubrication um, and then show you a little bit about what the product can do. So if you're not already using ultrasound for your lubrication program, it'll be a great introduction to how that all works um, and how it can really benefit um, your program um, and then give you a little sneak peek into how that, that Digital Grease Caddy can assist with that. So uh, hopefully you all can join Join us for that. The invite has already gone out, but we'll send it out again um, next week. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to register, you'll have another opportunity. Um, and then just want to point out um, to save the date for our conferences, um, we've got our Ultrasound World and Reliable Asset World conferences coming up May 8th through the 11th. Terry will be down there. He's uh, probably one of our best attendees, um, our longest running attendees. Um, so we're looking forward to that. It's a great great week of um, presentations on all things ultrasound, but also all the other pieces that go into reliability, um, like, you know, good lubrication programs and things like that. So, so definitely check out our websites and we hope we can see you guys down there. Um, but with that, I will let you all head on your merry way and uh, hope everyone has a great rest of the day. And again, Terry, thanks so much. And uh, we'll see you all next week, hopefully. All right.